That's not the right one. So we are picking up. Uh, we left off the other day with John Dunn's Valediction Forbidding Morning. <clears throat> on 704 and 705 in the 11th edition. <coughs> um, we left off on the one, two, three, four, five, six, at the end of the sixth stanza on page 705. <clears throat> the speaker has said, we'll back up to the sixth stanza. The speaker says, stanza six, are two souls therefore which are one, though I must go and do not yet a breach but an airy, but an expansion like gold to airy thinness beat. So two souls which are one, probably because the speaker is suggesting they're married. Okay. He says they don't break, they don't separate if the speaker leaves, they just extend, they stretch out. Okay. And then it's almost as if, if we assume the, the poem is kind of being said to someone else, it's almost as if between stanza six and stanza seven, the person listening, we'll call her the beloved, um, kind of gives them a strange look, like really? You think there's not gonna be a separation when you go to England and I, when you go to the continent and I stay here? It's, okay, okay. I get your idea, I get your point. If they are two, they are two so as stiff twin compasses are two. When Dunn says stiff twin compasses, he means the legs of a compass, like you would use to draw a circle in geometry. So one of those legs is a fixed point, the other one moves. So, thy soul the fixed foot makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. Now, notice if I were holding an actual compass in front of you like this, and I just move this leg, <coughs> this one doesn't move at all. When does it move? If I keep this foot on the same plane as this foot. So, when this, the farther this one goes out, the more this one does what? It leans towards it. That's his point. Thy soul the fixed foot makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. And though it in the center sit, thy soul, okay? So the beloved soul is the reference point. It's the, it's the stability, right? And though it in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, my soul, my body, when I leave you, it leans, that is, your soul leans and hearkens after it. Not literally calling, but by leaning towards it, it's like drawing it. And grows erect as the other comes home. So as this foot starts to return back, the fixed foot gets more and more upright. Such wilt thou be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Notice, must. It's like the speaker is saying, I don't have a choice here, okay? At this point in his life, talking about John Dunn, the author, Dunn was a secretary to a man named Sir Richard Drury, okay? Secretary was not like what we think of a secretary. The secretary was the person to, you know, a nobleman who handled all that individual's correspondence, all right? Not just opening mail and stuff, but writing letters on behalf of that individual and handled that individual's, what phrase I wanna use? Um, sucking up to others is a way of putting it, okay? Secretaries to important people were important people in their own right. Let me back up for just a minute with something about Dunn. In the late 1590s, 
Dunn became secretary to a man named Sir Thomas Edgerton. Okay? Edgerton was the keeper of the seal, the seal that would be used on all official documents that the queen would issue. So when she issued a document, it was like, go get Sir Thomas so that he can affix the seal. Very, very important job. Like, second or third most important person in the kingdom, right? Dunn was his secretary. So that put Dunn in a big, huge kind of position of authority and power. The problem is, at the time that he went to work for Edgerton, Dunn was... I don't remember how many years older. I think he was about 26. Might be a little bit off. And he met Edgerton's niece, who was 24, who was 14 at the time. They fell in love. Today we would call that probably, most people call that pedophilia or something like that. Fell in love. And in 1601, they secretly married. She was 17. No, she was 17 then, Dunn was 26 then, okay? So he was 23 when they met. Um, they secretly married. After about three months, they were discovered. They were found out, okay? She, her name is Ann Moore, she um, was Edgerton's niece. Her father was a man named Sir... Thomas Moore, okay? Not the, not the saint, all right? She was related to him. Uh, early 16th century, the guy who rebelled against, didn't really rebel, didn't go along with Henry VIII's desire to get a divorce so that he could remarry because 16th century, Sir Thomas Moore was um, diehard Catholic. You know, divorce is just not allowed. Ann Moore's father was also named Thomas, all right? Um, he had power also. When he discovered Dunn had married his daughter, he had her, he had Dunn thrown in jail for like three months. Okay. Before Dunn was thrown in jail, before their marriage was discovered, Dunn was on the fast track to wild success. I mean, secretary to the keeper of the seal. Um, he'd already been elected to parliament once, right? Um, he was well known by the intelligentsia and the literary circles and everything. Other writers are making reference to him and talking about him and all that, that kind of stuff. When his marriage comes out, everything is gone. He's immediately unemployed. He's in jail for three months. Uh, he comes out. The letters he wrote to her father all survived. They're at the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C. Um, he eventually wins over his father-in-law, and they have a fairly, fairly good relationship. Um, but Dunn never has, is, is never on the fast track to anything again after that point. He gets a job as secretary for... Um, Drury, okay, Robert Drury. In that, pays the bills partially. He also pays bills by writing poems in praise of people. Poems in praise of people, poems in praise of people who have died, celebratory poems upon their deaths, you know, things that are called obsequies and such, all right? So now I'll go back. <clears throat> so this is written 1611. This is 10 years after the marriage is known. Dunn is, other than working for um, Sir Robert Drury, he's, other than that, he's unemployed. He's got a wife. He's got a bunch of kids. Again, they married in 1601. She dies in 1617. Within that 16-year period, she has 12 children. I think it is five of them are either stillborn or die in infancy. All right? Prior to this trip, according to Dunn's first biographer, I mentioned this the other day, prior to this trip, according to Dunn's first biographer, who was a friend of Dunn's, who knew Dunn, and more Dunn, 
and her last name, had a premonition that something was going to happen while he was on this trip. That the child she was carrying, something was going to happen. And it did. We, we know that historically. He was gone. She delivered a stillborn child. Okay? So she's got feelings. Don't, don't go. On. And he's like, I've got to. Jury's going. He's requiring me to go. Very, very different, you know, time from us with maternity leave, paternity leave, all that kind of stuff. So, such will thou, the fixed foot, be to me who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Obliquely. I have to run. What's oblique mean? It's at an angle, right? I have to run, move, travel away from you. What will, as long as she stays there, be to him? She'll be the anchor. That is, as long as you stay here, what? I will return. If you don't, what's going to happen? What happens to a circle that you're drawing with a compass if that foot here that has the point on it moves? You get that kind of circle. Notice, not a circle. And notice what has happened at the end. They don't join up. I won't return to you unless you stay put, is the speaker's point. Thy firmness, your stability, what? Makes my circle just perfect, complete. Why do people wear wedding rings? Why a ring? Why not a square? I mean, part of it's physiology. Fingers aren't square. They kind of are when you think about it. The circle is a symbol of eternity. Never ending, never beginning. Okay? And makes me end where I begun. Which is kind of interesting because the makes me end where I begun kind of also goes back to the opening stanza. Right? Um, let's go on from there. So, next one. My Last Duchess. On 726, or 910 in the 10th edition. My Last Duchess is an example, I'm pretty sure it's mentioned on the previous page. No, it's not. It's a little bit earlier. My Last Duchess is an example of what's called a dramatic monologue. Okay. Some people consider some of what some of Dunn's poems as dramatic monologues. For example, the poem we just read. Some consider that to be a dramatic monologue of sorts. Right? Dramatic monologue, monologue, one person speaking. Dramatic, it's like almost like a play is being performed, but it's not literally. In a dramatic monologue. You do have a listener implied. Somebody is there, okay? And usually in a dramatic monologue, um, it's one of those bold-faced terms that's in the book, usually in a dramatic monologue, the speaker, in just running off his or her mouth, says some things about him or herself that they probably wouldn't intend to. In other words, they, re they reveal an inner aspect of their characters. And it's usually something kind of dark, okay? So this is Robert Browning, My Last Duchess. And this is kind of based upon a real story. Page 726 um, in the 11th edition. 910 in the 10th. And you've got a little footnote down at the bottom. In the 16th century, the Duke of this Italian city arranged to marry a second time after the mysterious death of his very young first wife. And, and by the way, if you want to kind of see this perform, there's a fantastic version by Sir Julian. Make sure I've got the right one. Father, not the son. Yeah, Sir Julian Glover, and it's on YouTube. It's five minutes at most. 
It's just him kind of not literally reading it. He's kind of moving around, if I remember. I've not watched it in 10 or 15 years. So that's my last duchess painted on the wall, looking as if she were alive. I call that piece a wonder now. Fra Pandolf's hands worked busily a day, and there she stands. Will you please you sit and look at her? I said Fra Pandolf by design, for never read strangers like you that pictured countenance, the depth and passion of its earnest glance. But to myself they turned, since none puts by the curtain I have drawn for you but I. It seemed as they would ask me, if they durst, how such a glance came there. So, not the first are you to turn and ask thus. Pause for a minute. Has anybody asked him a question within the context of the poem? No. It's assumed that the person that the speaker is walking with wants to ask a question and the speaker kind of reads his mind and says, no, no, we'll sit down. Let me pull the picture. Let me pull the curtain aside so you can see my last duchess. What does the last imply? He died. Yes. What else? Or divorce. Louder? Or divorce. Uh, possibly. <laughs> there was more than one. Last implies there was more than one. Notice the footnote talks about a guy who married a second time after his first, first wife mysteriously died. Browning changes that because the last duchess isn't the first duchess or the only duchess. He doesn't say, here's my former wife. Okay? So, he implies, I know you want to ask questions, so we'll stop. I'll pull the curtain. You can look at her, and I'll talk a little bit. Sir, Twas not her husband's presence only called that spot of joy into the duchess's cheek. So notice we're told something about the appearance of the duchess's face in the painting. What's the spot of joy in her cheek? Could be dimple, but dimples are there all the time. Is she blushing? I think she's blushing. Like somebody has said something that maybe embarrassed her. Notice you can be embarrassed for good reasons as well as bad reasons. You can be embarrassed because you caught you were caught doing something wrong or badly. You can also be embarrassed because somebody praises you and you're like, stop. Okay. Notice it wasn't her husband's presence only that caused that spot of joy on her cheek. Perhaps Fra Pandolf, the painter, chanced to say, her mantle laps over my lady's wrist too much. Or paint must never hope to reproduce the faint half flush that dies along her throat. So he puts these words into Fra, Fra Pandolf, the artist's mouth. Okay? What does that mean? You know, maybe the mantle laps too much over my lady's wrist. Her sleeves are doing what? Covering too much. Pull it up. What's that imply? Show a little more skin. Okay? Six, apparently, 16th century Italy, it was appropriate for a woman's wrist to be covered. Just like in the, what, the 19th century, you know, a woman's ankle should be covered. You show some ankle, you know, you're loose and stuff, okay? So, or paint can never hope to reproduce the slight blushing even on her neck. Notice that dies along her throat. Such stuff was courtesy, she thought. And cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. That is, Fra Pandolf, the speaker, tells us, excuse me, the speaker tells us that his last duchess took Fra Pandolf's words 
merely as a sign of respect, of courtesy. Okay? Does the speaker think that? And cause enough for calling up that spot of joy. She had a heart, how shall I say, too soon made glad, too easily impressed. Why too soon? Why too easily? What does he mean? She had a heart too soon made glad, made happy, and too easily impressed. What's he saying about his last duchess? She's naive. Could be that she's naive. It could also be that she's easily pleased. It doesn't take much to bring that little bit of blush to her face. She liked whatever she looked on, and her looks went everywhere. Sir, twas all one. What does it mean she liked whatever she looked at? It means she took joy in everything she saw. It's like everything was full of wonder for her. A tree, a flower, a brook, a bird, a painting, a work of art, something her husband gave her. Notice. Sir, twas all one. Everything she looked at brought her joy. Now notice what he's going to start to say. My favor at her breast, that is something like a jewel. A locket, a cameo that she wore on a chain around her neck, okay? The dropping of the daylight in the West, a sunset. So the nice gem that I bought her, the sunset, the bough of cherries some officious fool broke in the orchard for her. Officious means somebody who's really trying to do things rightly and correctly and it, he broke it in the orchard, meaning he broke a bough of cherries off a cherry tree, put it in a bowl, and brought to her. Why? To please her. He knew she would be pleased by that. The white mule she rode with round the terrace. Pause. All and each would draw from her alike the approving speech or blush at least. What has he just equated on the part of his last duchess? What did it cost the officious fool to break a little branch of cherries off, off a cherry tree in the orchard? Nothing. What did it cost him to provide for her the favor at her breast? Probably something. And he says, for her, they were all of equal worth, equal value. She thanked men. <clears throat> good. Good. Right? Somebody does something nice for you, you should give thanks to them. But thanked somehow, I know not how, as if she ranked my gift of a 900 years old name with anybody's gift. I gave her in marriage what? A heritage. Notice, a 900 years old name. His family can be traced back. And that probably implies he's got the paperwork <laughs> to show it, right? As if she ranked that with the stupid bowl of cherries or the white mule. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Trifling. What's a trifle? What's trivia pursuit? Trivia is related to trifle. It's a pursuit of unimportant stuff, right? It's stupid little details, okay? 
the kind of thing my brain sorts. Every time I played Trivial Pursuit, I'm not bragging or anything, I've won. Because I just remember stupid little stuff from TV shows back in the 70s, for example, or late 60s and all throughout the 80s and stuff. I mean, that kind of stuff, sports not as much. Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? Even had you skill in speech, <coughs> which I have not, Notice the self-deprecation. Why do people use self-deprecating humor? What's it do for your audience? It kind of draws them in and says, look, I'm just like you. Even though I'm speaking to you, you know, like this speaker, and have a 900 years old name, you know, I, I can't speak well. Even had you skill in speech, which I have not, to make your will quite clear to such an one and say, just this or that in you disgust me, here you miss or there exceed the mark. And if she let herself be lessened so, nor plainly set her wits to yours forsooth and made excuse, pause, even then, or Ian, then would be some stooping. And I choose never to stoop. What, what's, he, what's he getting at when he's talking about this stooping? The stooping to blame, the stooping to point out faults or errors in her character. What does it mean to stoop? It's like this. You bend over. What do you do, kind of metaphorically, when you bend over? You lower yourself. You lessen yourself. Okay? Who'd stoop to blame this sort of trifling? That is, the things he's just been pointing out. The trifles in his mind of her comparing the favor at his breast, at her breast, the 900 years old name, with the stupid things people give her. Okay? But what does he tell us? And I choose never to stoop. It would be stooping for me. It would be lowering myself to point out those foibles in her. Oh, sir, she smiled, no doubt. Whenever I passed her. It's almost like when the, when the hearer hears, and I choose never to stoop, it's like the speaker or the hearer gets a look on his face like, uh-oh, this is, no, 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 no. Whenever I walk by, she smiled at me. This, excuse me, whenever I passed her. But who passed without much the same smile? She smiled when I would pass her. She smiled when the stable boy would pass her. She smiled when one of her ladies passed her. What's she pointing out? What's, what's the hidden fault the speaker is revealing? Or the hidden part of his character that he probably doesn't intend to reveal? Is he jealous? Very much so. Where does jealousy arise from? Insecurity, which also arises from the same thing, the ego. You're insecure because you think what about yourself? You ought to be better. You're jealous because you think somebody else has something more than you do. But your ego tells you nobody's as good as you are or as good as I am. So, who passed without much the same smile? This grew. What is the this? Is jealousy? The jealousy, the insecurity, all the things he's been pointing out. I would give her stuff and she valued it as much as, uh, just as much as everybody else's gifts. This grew, colon, excuse me, semicolon. semicolon. I gave commands. So if he gave commands, what did he actually do? He stooped. <laughs> he tried to change her behavior. Then all smiles stopped together. 
There she stands, as if alive. Why did all smiles stop together? What is, I gave commands? Now, I, I suggested I gave commands was, he stooped. He told her to change her behavior. That may not be what I gave commands refers to. I gave commands may refer to the next line. This crew, semicolon, I gave commands, semicolon, then all smiles stopped together. Why? Possibly. <laughs> Dead people don't smile. Because what happens after? Then all smiles stopped together. Period. Hard stop. There she stands as if alive. Not alive anymore. That's why he's... We don't know yet what he and this other individual are doing. Do we? We don't know why he and this other individual are walking up or down the stairs. Now we find out. Will it please you rise? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master's no munificence is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. Okay, so what word there tells us the purpose for this meeting. Dowry. What's a dowry? Payment. What kind? We don't have them anymore. Let me rephrase that. My son-in-law didn't get a dowry. <laughs> Put it that way. Maybe some people still do. It's a payment given by father of the bride to the future husband. It's what the bride brings to the marriage. Okay? So, will it please your rides? We'll meet the company below then. I repeat, the count your master is no munificence. What's munificence? Generosity. I know your master is liberal with his wealth. Is ample warrant that no just pretense of mine for dowry will be disallowed. No just Pretense. He's saying, I have a requirement for the dowry. And because your master is liberal with his wealth, I know it won't be disallowed. Though his fair daughter's self, as I avowed at starting, is my object. I don't really want the dowry. It's just her. I'm so in love with her. True or false? Did we hear that at the beginning? No, we didn't. It's like we step into a conversation that's ongoing. Okay? So, what happens after, as I have out at starting, is my object, period. Between there and the next word, think drama. It's like the hearer of these words does something. Nay, we'll go together down, sir. What's that imply? Nay, no, why no? Because the hearer either gets up and starts taking several steps ahead, or a comment unheard by us is made, such as possibly. I need to go speak to my master first. Why? What has this speaker revealed? Probably unintentionally. I killed my last duchess. I'm really looking forward to marrying your master's daughter. And he's got the other guy's gone. No, hell no, I gotta go warn him. Nay, we'll go down together down, sir. Notice Neptune, though, taming a seahorse, thought to rarity, which cause of Innsbruck cast in bronze for me. Why not end it with your wife, your 
master's daughter is my object. Why do the part about Neptune taming a seahorse? Maybe like to change the subject? Possibly. What else? What's the guy indicating? They're going down. Um, you don't see this very much. Go to Biltmore. I'm sure you can see it there. I've never been there, but I've been to a bunch of houses, manor houses, royal houses, and things like that in England. You walk up the staircase, and what is the wall full of? Paintings. Sculptures sometimes. There will be a little plinth sticking out, and a sculpture sticking. He's walking down and pointing out what? All of his artwork. What does this guy really want his wife to be? Another piece of art. Another collection. Because the nice thing about a portrait is it doesn't do what? Unless you're in Harry Potter. Uh, you go to the Black House. It doesn't talk back. And you can always do what? It's got to be where, where Jake never thought about it before. Where J.K. Rowling got the idea for the Black House in the Harry Potter novels. Order of the Phoenix. Where they go up the stairs and there are paintings and elf heads. And there's a painting of Sirius Black's mom. And if you pull the screen, the curtain back, the thing yells and screams at you. You cover it and it's silent. Okay? This guy's a collector, but he's also apparently a wife killer. Okay? Um, next poem God's Grandeur, 740. 740. Okay? Gerard Manley Hopkins, a little bit later than um, Browning in terms of his dates, dies the same year, but he's born 32 years later. Only lives 55 years. 55? Yeah, 55 years. Um, Browning lived for 77 years. God's grandeur. Gerard Manley Hopkins was a Catholic priest. All right? This is long after Catholic, yes? In the 10th edition, where is it, right there, uh, 929. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have a little sonnet. Sonnet, one of those terms that's in bold, you need to know. Sonnet is a 14-line poem, usually made of three quatrains and a final couple. Coplanes, uh, quatrains, four line stanza with some kind of rhyme scheme, okay? A, B, A, B, A, B, B, C, something like that in terms of the sounds at the end of the line. God's Grandeur, 1877. The world is charged with the grandeur. I'm going to read the whole thing first. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Let me pause for a moment. An Italian sonnet is usually formed. This is the style for, or the, um, Structure for an English sonnet. An Italian sonnet is usually formed into an octave and a sestet. The first eight lines, and then the final six lines, okay? And at the end of the octave, you get what's called a volta. Volta means turn. Change of emphasis, change of idea, often some kind of contradiction is brought in. Right? So, let's look at those first two stanzas. 
Look at the rhyme scheme. Look at the very end of the line. Line one, God. Line two, oil. Line three, oil. Line four, odd. A, B, B, A. And then line five, A again. And then six and seven, B, B. They have the same rhyme, A. So it's A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A. Okay? Um, the rest. And for all this, that is, and for all, what I've just said in the preceding eight lines, and for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. So, the octave is about what? Because it's not the same thing that the sestep is about. Notice, it starts, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. What does it mean, charged? This is far enough into the Industrial Revolution. Electricity is well known. It's widely available. Not widely in the sense that it's in everybody's houses kind of a thing. But it is being used. And they know about electrical charges. Okay? It's charged. Like, if this... Nothing in here is metal. <laughs> if this were made of metal, and if it had an electrical charge, and I did that, I would get zapped. Okay? It releases that charge. So he's saying, everything in the world is charged with God's grandeur, God's glory. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. And your gloss says, shaken gold foil. It could be tin foil. Hold a piece of tin foil out in the sun and do this, and it sends all kinds of reflections. Okay? It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. The images are like of, of olive oil being crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? What's the word wreck mean? We don't use it ever. We only use it when it's part of a larger word. And even that one we don't use very often. Reckon. reckon. I reckon that. What does that mean? I think. So why do men then now not think his rod? We would throw in a preposition about. What's his rod? Judgment? Probably. Okay. Why do men then now not consider God's judgment, God's government, God's rule, God's power, God's authority? All those things. Now look at the next stanza. Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. Why repeat have trod three times? What does it mean? It's the past tense of what verb? Anybody know? To tread. That is, to walk. Generations have walked, have walked, have walked. So what have they done to where they have walked? What happens if you walk, and a bunch of people constantly walk across the same patch of grass? Grass dies, right? You wear a path into it. And all is seared with trade. What does it mean to sear something? Like seared meat. It's burned. It's crisped. Okay? Everything is touched, essentially, he's saying. With trade. Bleared. Smeared with toil. And where's man's smudge and shares man's smell? The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. Why the emphasis on trade, work, smudging, destroying? What has humanity, the speaker is saying, done to the natural world? Okay. And he's writing this in 1877. 
not 2022. You know, we could cue the, the uh, lyric from um, Jimmy Buffett. They paved paradise and, anybody know the rest? Put up a parking lot. You take a beautiful piece of land. I, I remember when I lived in Orlando, went to this big Presbyterian mega church, you know, and somebody made the comment about the church wanting to buy this piece of property right off I-4, I-4, which bisects Orlando, major, major, major thoroughfare, millions of people go by daily. And this person made a comment about this piece of land that was wasted. Why was it wasted? It was actually had an old orange grove on it because it wasn't being used. There wasn't an office building or a church building or something like that on it. And I thought, no, it's not being wasted. It's, it's what it is. It's producing, you know, oxygen and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Notice the soil is bare now. Why? What happens when you plant and plant and plant and plant and plant repeatedly, years on end? What, ha what will happen to that soil? But you know, it dies. It literally dies. It will not grow anything. That soil has to be regenerated and renourished. You have to go get dead plant material and put it in and till it in. And that helps bring microbes and bugs and stuff back so that the ground will, that's why every few years, land should lie fallow. You should just let what's growing grow. And then the following year, you till that in, and then you can start growing again. So, but foot can't feel the soil. Why? Because the feet are now shod. That's just, a, it's a slight indication of how separated humanity <clears throat> has come from the natural world, the speaker is saying. <clears throat> and for all this, the for there means despite. Or nevertheless, <clears throat> nature is never spent. What do you do when you spend your money? What do you do when you spend your paycheck? You don't have it anymore, right? Okay. He says, and despite all this, nature is never totally destroyed. Why? There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. In other words, you just got to dig a little deeper. Why? Because of the first line. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. We can cover it over. We can try to destroy it. And though the last lights off the black west went, meaning sunset, so when the sun is fully set and you no longer see any hint of light on that western horizon, what? Oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs. What's this image showing us? It's never totally black. Meaning... It's not totally night. There's always, as little orphan Annie sings, the sun coming up tomorrow. That is, even though it's pitch black in the west, it's starting to turn brown in the east. Why? Because the sun, while it hasn't reached the horizon yet, it's coming. It, start, it turns brownish first. That is, it gets lighter and then lighter and lighter. Why? Because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast, with ah, bright wings. Like at the beginning of the book of Genesis, God's, you know, let there be, let there be, let there be. And we're told, and the spirit hovered over the firmament. And the speaker's implication is, and it's still happening. No matter what humanity does, it's still ongoing okay turn from there to a nonsense poem any of you read this like in high school or middle school jabberwocky by lewis carroll 
also called Charles Lutwidge Dodson. That's his real name. Lewis Carroll was his pen name. Lewis Carroll was a professor of geometry at Oxford. Okay. The reason he could write such great nonsense poetry is because he was so logically minded. All right. We're gonna, I'm going to read this. And I'm not going to say much about it because you can't say much about it because it is literally nonsense. It's meant just to be heard for the oddity of the sounds and the joy, for lack of a better word. Twas brillig, and the slithy toes did gyre and gimble in the wave. Or is it gyre and gimble? Did gyre and gimble in the wave? All mimsy were the borogoves in the momrads out grave. Now, notice, what does that mean? <laughs> but grammatically, it's all perfect. You have nouns and verbs, and the nouns are acting properly on the verbs or are properly receiving the action of the verb. It's just that the nouns, we don't know what they are. What, what's brillig? What's a slithy tove? No, the slithy is an adjective, right? It's modifying toe. We just don't. Is it slippery and... The I, I can't remember. Something else. What Carol is doing here is he's creating, and I'm pretty sure this is one of the words in bold print in your book, he's creating a lot of what are called portmanteaus, when you take parts of words and jam them together. If you've paid attention, you've heard me many times this semester. Start with one word and I finish with the other. Okay? It's usually because I'm tired or I'm trying to go too quickly. And I'll put one thing and combine it to another. Beware of the jabberwock, my son, the jaws that bite, the claws that catch. Beware of the jub jub bird and shun the frumious bender snatch. He took his vorpal sword in hand. So, you know, took, sword, in hand, all makes perfect sense. But what's vorpal? He took his vorpal sword in hand, long time the maxim, maxim foe he sought. So rested he by the tum, -tum tree and stood a while in thought. And as in oofish thought he thought he stood, the jabberwock with eyes of flame came whiffling through the tolgy wood and burbled as it came. One, two, one, two, and through and through, the vorpal blade went sticker snack. He left it dead, and with its head, he went galumphing back. And hast thou slain the jabberwock? Come to my arms, my beamish boy. O Fred, just day, kalu, kale. He chortled in his joy. Twas brilliant in the slidey toes, and it goes on. There's actually a movie made based on this. I remember seeing it sometime in the late 70s or, or early 80s. It's obviously not a nonsense because it makes sense, okay? Just a little fun point. Um, 780, what time is it? 8.53. 780, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? This is one of Shakespeare's most famous sonnets, okay? It's an English sonnet. It has this structure, okay? The sonnet by Gerard Manley Hopkins had this structure. All right. This is a poem actually written to, excuse me, this is a poem actually spoken by a male to another male. It's not homoerotic, it's not homosexual, okay? This is back in a period when men could have very profound, close friendships, spoken of as love. Today, that's gotten all twisted. So, shall I compare thee to a summer's day? We only have a minute. I'll just read it and then we'll talk about it a little bit on the next day. I know we're behind. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? There weren't more love. No, we won't actually, because it's too. I won't even be able to finish reading. So we'll stop there. Um, shoot. All right. And they just end up not being able to discuss all the poems, but they will be on 